As summer is in full swing, you're either ready to show off the hard work you did to get your body beach ready, or regretting that you spent more time at the fridge than the gym this winter. It's a little late for crash diets. A juice cleanse won't help you now. But maybe summer is the perfect time to get healthy in some deeper ways. What might it mean to leave some toxic situations? What might it mean to cut out some toxic people? To remove some toxic relationships? To abandon some toxic habits? Let's pursue some ancient wisdom. Let's find a better way. Let's let the Holy Spirit do a work in us. Let's settle in for detox, a deep cleanse for your soul. So, uh, I have to confess something to you all that I'm not proud of. All right? But I think some of you might be able to resonate with, relate to just, just a little bit. Um, I secretly love those snarky lists that show up on social media. Right, like if I'm just scrolling along and I'm looking at everybody's obligatory back to school, first day pictures, and all the political rants, and, and then a recipe that I'm gonna screenshot but never actually cook. Uh, and I see one of those little articles that shows up that's like, you know, 13 tweets this week that only parents of a middle schooler can appreciate. I'm probably tumbling down that rabbit hole, right? If I'm scrolling along, it's like 30 behind the scenes, back to, you know, uh, uh, details from the set of The Godfather that you never knew. I'm losing 10 minutes reading through the list. It's just this thing. Uh, I don't know that I, I, I like it. I'm not proud of it, but it is what it is. Call it what you will. It's perhaps a guilty pleasure, an unhealthy addiction, but given that one of them turned out to be the perfect way to introduce this last week in our series through Proverbs, for at least today, I'm calling it sermon research, right? Okay, because that sounds better than anything else we might label it. So we're going to go with research. Uh, th this particular list was put out by a site called Digital Synopsis that claims to be the go-to place for creativity and marketing and their, uh, their list that caught my eye was 40 honest advertising slogans. Now, we're not going to go through all 40 of them, I promise. But there were a few that I wanted to share with you guys as we get started today. Uh, if we think back to the age-old debate, Coke or Pepsi, we might expect an ad that looks something like this. Pepsi, when there's no Coke. Right? You go to the restaurant, you're like, I'll have a Coke. They're like, is Pepsi okay? Is it? Is it really? Or perhaps, perhaps you and your family would like to host a game night with neighbors you don't want to speak to any longer. You might try Monopoly, a great way to ruin friendships. Somebody's going to get mad. Somebody's going to throw things. Somebody's going to flip the board. Everybody's going to quit early. Uh, or perhaps you're like me and you look forward to that time every year when you, when you get that free book in the mail that turns out to just be a list of characters and how to contact them by their landlines. You might like the yellow pages. Here, you throw this away. <laughs> or perhaps for those mornings you wake up and you're not quite feeling right. You just don't feel well. That's that's the days that are made for WebMD, where you can convince yourself you have a terminal illness, <laughs> right? Because chances are you, you probably just slept funny, and that's the, the sore spot in your neck. But why rule out the fact that, that that pain might be the indication of some rare genetic disorder that predominantly only affects people of Serbian descent with mixed-race parents? I mean... Somebody out there has to make up that other 0.00034% that are affected by this malady. It might as well be you, and WebMD can let you know. So I got to thinking about this. I was reading through the, the, these lists and the way that, that uh, oftentimes we, we come to expect advertising to not really be accurate. 
We expect it to kind of spin things in a positive direction. And so I got to thinking that, uh, that maybe the book of Proverbs could, could make one of these advertisements that's more honest for one of the primary concepts we find throughout the book of Proverbs. And so I, so I came up with my own honest advertisement here from Proverbs. Folly, a shortcut to wisdom that's just a fast track to death. Because over and over again, throughout the book of Proverbs, we, we keep coming into, this, this, uh, into contact with this idea of folly, of foolishness, and Proverbs keeps telling us over and over again the way that folly sets itself up to look like wisdom. Folly sets itself up to promise everything that, that, that wisdom will get you. It just doesn't go anywhere. It... it, it it just leads to death. It's an empty promise. It's a false advertisement that, that says one thing and does another. The, the, the path of folly ultimately is an illusion. It promises you everything that wisdom will get you without any of the discipline, without any of the waiting, without any of the hard work that it takes to pursue wisdom and discipline and a life rooted in the ways and words of Jesus. Folly advertises itself as one thing and then becomes something else. And why? Well, because if it was up front with you, if folly advertises itself as foolishness, no one would go that way. If from the outset, folly simply announced, if you follow me, I will lead you to death, nobody's going to go that route. And so the reality is when we find ourselves in the midst of folly, when we find our lives plagued by this toxicity we've been talking about, the reality is most of the time it's probably unintentional. Right? Like, it's not something you set out to do. You don't set out to say, how can I live a more toxic life? Most of the time when we find ourselves plagued by toxicity, it, we got there unintentionally. We got there slowly and incrementally, one small decision at a time. And that means that sometimes we are unaware of the toxicity that is within us. We're unaware of the toxicity we surround ourselves with. We're unaware of the toxicity in our relationships. All the things we've been talking about these last several weeks, oftentimes we're simply unaware of them until they're brought to our attention. And thankfully, from the outset, the book of Proverbs has told us, it's given us a surefire way to identify those toxic things in life. It has given us a surefire way to know if we need a detox. Let's look together again at Proverbs, this time in Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27. We're going to look today starting at verse number 19 where we read this. As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. Remember all the way back at the beginning of this conversation, we, we were introduced to, to the wise father of Proverbs who was sitting down with his son to, to instill wisdom, to pass wisdom from one generation to the next. And, and you might remember, if you were with us, all the way back at the beginning of this series, what did the father say? Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart, the father said to his son. And as we're closing in on the end of the book of Proverbs, we've kind of come full circle to that idea. Uh, we hear in Proverbs 27 the, this line that as water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. Literally, what Proverbs says is as the surface or the face of the water shows you your face. 
so too does your life reveal your heart. You see, mirrors were a, a, a luxury item in the ancient Near East. Most people wouldn't have had access to them because the only mirrors that existed were highly polished metal, which meant they were out of reach economically for most people. And so the average person's best opportunity to know what they looked like was to catch a passing reflection of their face in the surface of the water. Proverbs says, just the same way that the, the water will reflect and tell you what you look like, your life will show you what your heart is in tuned to. And so, from the outset, Proverbs has said, above everything else, guard your heart. Because whatever it is that becomes uh, uh, the focus of your heart will ultimately be revealed in your life. And so, as we round out this conversation, another thing we have to keep in mind, it's there in your teaching notes, if you're following along in the app, you can jot it down. Wisdom helps you recognize the toxicity in your heart by what's reflected in your life. Right? No one, no one follows the path of folly, the, the toxic path on purpose. But if you want to be able to spot where it has infiltrated your life, wisdom will help you recognize the toxicity in your heart by what is reflected in your life. If you're not sure you need a detox, you need to simply look at the outflow of your heart because what is making its way into your life is going to reveal what's in your heart. We can cover it up for a while, we can try to hide it, we can conceal it, we can pretend like it's not there. But eventually, what Proverbs wants us to understand is the toxicity that we allow inside of us will ultimately reveal itself. If, if you give it enough time, it will come out, it will be displayed. You can try to cover it up, you can try to hide it, but at some point, starts to break through and begins to display for everyone to see. And wisdom will help you recognize that as you look at and assess your life. We need that wisdom. Because folly it has a way of drawing us away from wisdom very subtly and dishonestly. Right? It's, it's the epitome of false advertising. It's telling you uh, it will give you the shortcut to life. It will give you the shortcut to wisdom when all it is doing is leading you to death. Bali says, I will give you all the results of a righteous life without the bother of actually having to be righteous. And so... We must pursue a wisdom that will help, help us to recognize that toxicity where it exists. Because you're going along and suddenly you start to realize, man, maybe there is some toxic stuff in me. Maybe I am in some toxic relationships. Maybe I do have some toxic habits. All the things we've been talking about these last several weeks together. You're going along and all of a sudden you, you realize, hey, maybe there is some reflection of toxicity in my life. What do we do? Right? We didn't get there on purpose. You didn't wake up and say, I think I want to be a toxic person. I think I want to engage in toxic relationships. I'm going to just practice a bunch of toxic habits and see how poisonous I can become. We, we don't say that. So what do you do if all of a sudden you find yourself dealing with the reality of, these, uh, of this toxicity? We, we've said throughout this series, the point is to recognize toxicity so that the poisonous things that are around you don't get inside you. That sounds like a noble goal. But what if they already have? Then what? Thankfully, Proverbs continues to help us find the answer to that. We just continue over into chapter 18 in Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28, verse 13. We read that he who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. 
we have this, this natural tendency, especially the further we go down the path of folly. We have this natural tendency to try to hide and conceal whatever we don't think we should be doing. Whatever sort of life we shouldn't be pursuing, when we find ourselves doing those things, there's this natural thing in us. It's like, well, we'll just kind of cover that up. We won't, we won't really let people see that. And what Proverbs 28 says is that when we encounter toxicity in our life, we need to do the counterintuitive thing. But naturally, the, when you re- encounter toxicity in your life, your initial response is, I need to cover that up, I need to hide it, and I need to like, make sure nobody knows it's there. Proverbs 28 says, do the exact opposite of that. <laughs> you need to confess it. it you, you need to give voice to the toxicity that is killing you. It, it invites us to do the, this counterintuitive thing to identify the, the toxicity of our lives, to to identify our our brokenness and our sin, and then to bring it into the light. Which doesn't sound like very much fun, does it? Think about the things you're most inclined to want no one to know, especially not God. And Proverbs says that's exactly the stuff you need to be talking to him about. And we go, well, well, but I I really don't don't want him to know. Oh, it's too late for that. He kind of already does. (laughs) And and so Proverbs says, look, if you conceal your sin, you don't prosper. Whoever confesses it and renounces them finds mercy. Bring it into the light. And, And Proverbs says that when you conceal your sin... That's a path towards not succeeding. Which at some point we raise our hand and go, um, I'd like a word then, because sometimes it sure seems like the toxic people around me are succeeding. <laughs> sometimes it feels like the, the, the people who don't care about their toxicity are the ones who are getting ahead. And that's when we have to remember Proverbs are what? They're principles, not promises. And the whole of the Old Testament wisdom tradition, if we dig into the, to the whole lump of these books that are dealing with wisdom, what we're going to find is they're wrestling with that very question. Why is it that sometimes the wicked do seem to prosper? Why does it seem that sometimes the righteous suffer? I mean, the book of Job is a perfect example of the way of the opposite of what this proverb says right here's job he's a guy he's got it together he's pursuing the right things he's trying to serve god and everything in his life falls apart right so so scripture itself is wrestling with that tension that sometimes it feels like things don't work the way they should work by the rules that those who try to hide and conceal their sin seem to prosper in fact that's what job's buddies show up and tell him they're like job just confess it, man. It'll be easier for everybody. And he insists for 40 chapters, I'm innocent. And if God would just give me my day in court, I'd prove I'm innocent. And then God shows up at the end of the book and Job goes, yeah, I'm going to maintain my innocence, but God, you know better. Right, so, so there's this wrestling within the, within the pages of Scripture itself to say sometimes it doesn't always seem like those who conceal their sin don't prosper. But remember what the other principle we saw about, about Proverbs is this wisdom is rooted in what? A covenant relationship with God. And when we view it through a covenant relationship with God, what it means to be in right relationship with God, then even when the wicked seem to prosper... It's a hollow sort of thing. Because ultimately, when all is said and done, God will serve justice. God will see that things are made right. And so Proverbs says, he who confesses his sin finds renewal. Bring it into the light. Because sin dies in the light. 
Because all of a sudden, now you're accountable for it. Now you're responsible for it. It's not this thing you can tuck away and conceal and make sure nobody knows about. Brings it into the light. And there's that, that thing in us. We call it flesh. We call it sin. It wants to justify our toxicity. It, it wants to convince us it's not as bad as it seems. And even if it is, well, you didn't get there on purpose, right? Like that's the false advertising of folly. Nobody chooses that path knowing, oh yeah, this is a, this is a dumb idea. And the next choice after that is an even dumber one. And it's gonna be, become more and more toxic. And so there's this thing in us that, that, that crops up to try to justify it. And so we, we find ourselves saying, like, well, maybe, maybe there's some toxic stuff in me, but, but I didn't know it was there. So maybe you just mind your business, leave me alone, and, and we'll go on, right? It's kind of like when my kids are, are, are tattling on one another, uh, especially the younger ones, right? And one of them does something, and then they come and tell mom and dad, so-and-so hit me, kicked me, bit me, whatever. And you go and ask them about it. If you've had kids, been around kids, you'll know what comes next. Well, it, it was an accident. Okay, first of all, <laughs> how did that accidentally happen? Right, you start going through the process going, yeah, I don't think it's an accident. You may not have intended the consequence. You may not have intended the outcome. But there was at some point a deliberate choice that was made. Right? And when we're, when we're dealing with kids, we can identify that and go, well, okay, you know, that's fine. But when it comes to the toxicity of sin in our lives, we try to tend to do the same thing. Well, I didn't mean for it to go that way. That wasn't my intent. And so we just kind of justify it, push it aside. But here's the problem with that. If you're sitting in a pool of poison, it doesn't matter whether you got there on purpose or not. It's still going to kill you. Right? And, and there are exceptions, right? There, there are people who seem to be wired in such a way that they're like the sugared up kid at the city pool just doing like cannonballs over and over into the pool of toxicity. But most of us don't live that way. <laughs> Most of us find ourselves in those places and we're not sure how we got there. But there's still that thing in us that says, okay, so if I didn't choose this, I didn't intend this, then I'll just ignore it. And Proverbs says, no, no. That's not how toxicity works. In fact, it, it sounds like something we, we read in the, the Old Testament law. If you want to jump over with me to, to the book of Leviticus. Uh, and I know you're... The, pages of your Bible are still stuck together there, right? Like prime apart. If you've got an electronic Bible, it'll throw off all of the algorithms of your reading plan. Uh, but jump into Leviticus, a place we don't often go all that often because it feels really out of touch and, and unproductive. But man, gives us some real insight into the holiness of God. Listen to what it says here in Leviticus chapter 5. It says, or if a person touches anything unceremonial or ceremonially unclean, whether the carcass of unclean wild animals or unclean livestock or of unclean creatures that move along the ground, even though he is unaware of it, he has become unclean and is guilty. Or if he touches human uncleanness, anything that would make him unclean, even though he is unaware of it, when he learns of it, he will be guilty. Or if a person thoughtlessly takes an oath to do anything, whether good or evil, in any manner one might carelessly swear about, even though he is unaware of it, in any case, when he learns of it, he will be guilty. When anyone is guilty of any of these ways, he must confess in what way he has sinned, and as penalty for the sin he has committed, he must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flocks as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him and for his sin. And so there's this thing in us sometimes where we recognize the toxicity that has crept into our lives and we want to say, yeah, but I didn't mean for it to be there. I didn't know it was there. And we might avoid Leviticus like one of the many oozing sores it describes. But it gives us this insight and wisdom into the holiness of God that says it doesn't matter whether the toxicity is something you knew was there or you've just become aware of, the response 
and the corrective is the same. It requires repentance, confession. Bring it into the light where sin dies. So if wisdom will help us recognize the toxicity of our heart by looking at what's reflected in our lives, then what do we do? We've already been hitting all around it. Repentance. Ask God to remove the toxicity and renews your pursuit of wisdom. God has given us the, this, this mechanism for dealing with toxicity. This mechanism called repentance because repentance is asking God to remove that toxicity and to renew our pursuit of wisdom. Sometimes you go, well, why? I mean, maybe I need to confess something. I need to, to tell God that I'm sorry, but what's this part about renewing a pursuit of wisdom? I mean, I'm still on the path of wisdom. But if we take seriously what Proverbs says, that, that folly and wisdom are divergent paths, that the further you go down the path of folly, the further you get from the path of wisdom, then there are moments and times when we need to find one of those exit ramps we talked about early on in the series, where we recognize I'm on a road that is leading me away from life and towards death. And so not only do I need to deal with the fact that, that I have sinned or am engaging in toxic practices, becoming a toxic person, there's something that needs to bring me back to the pursuit of the right things, to bring me back to the pursuit of the ways and words of Jesus, to set aside the path that I've been on and to renew a commitment to the path of, of, uh, of wisdom and grace. In the New Testament, the Apostle John writes to his churches, and what does he tell them in 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, when we recognize our toxicity, our go-to response should be repentance. In a world driven by folly, our go-to response is to conceal it, to hide it, to excuse it, to ignore it. But if we want to pursue a life of wisdom, shaped by the ways and words of Jesus, our go-to response to toxicity has to become an attitude of repentance and renewal. I invite the band to come back. Because as we, as we come to the end of this series, as we begin to, to put a bow on this conversation about the book of Proverbs, my hope is that we haven't just encountered a bunch of bumper sticker truths. Some things that sound really good in theory that we can put on a wall, that we can, can, can you know, send out as a, as a tweet and go, oh, isn't that beautiful? I wanna live a life like that. It's all flowers and rainbows and wisdom and grace. I, I hope we've encountered something deeper than that. I hope in, in the course of this conversation we've been able to, to recognize the impact of toxicity in our lives, that we've been able to, to see if, if there are ways we have become toxic people, that we've been able to, to, to look at our relationships and see if they are toxic. More than that, I hope we're being equipped to know what to do with toxicity when we find it, to... to to move in such a way that we can begin to, to ask the Lord to remove it from us, to draw us back into the way of wisdom. The, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is always one that draws us toward the path of life. Before faith in Christ, we, we talk about a grace that goes before, that, that calls us and draws us to him. After faith, the Holy Spirit comes along as, as a guide, convicting of sin, inviting us towards renewal. My hope is that over the course of the last several weeks, we've been able to, to learn how to spot toxicity when it shows up. But I really hope we go past that to, to say, what do I do with it then? How do I find renewal? Change the path of our life. Once again, with 
all that I have and all that I am, chase after the path of wisdom and the path of life. 